Good evening, everybody. It's Andy from Snow Camps Europe here in Caprun, Austria, with this week's Sunday Ski Cast. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. So before I, uh, I start with this week's, I'd just like to thank everybody who sent in questions last week uh, and also feedback. We received uh, a lot of feedback, uh, a lot of positive feedback last week. So thank you for that. Um, thank you for everybody who has sent in a question for the boot fitters this evening. We have got uh, questions from all over the world. We've got questions from Australia, New Zealand, uh, Japan, um, America, and all over Europe. Uh, please do feel free to hit the like button, share this with your friends, and also, if you haven't been able to ask a question so far, you can put that in the comments of this uh, broadcast, and we will try and answer as many of them as we can this evening. But what I will say is we have had a, a massive number of questions for this week's um, guests. Colin Martin from Solutions for Feet, and Fabian Stiepel, our boot fitter here in Caprun. Uh, if for some reason we run out of time and we can't answer them all, then we will come back and we'll do a second broadcast in a week or two. So do not worry if we don't answer your question. Um, if you would like to host a watch party, then please feel free to do so. Just press the watch party button below and let all of your friends see the, uh, the broadcast. Um, that is about it, I think. So um, once again, thanks for watching, folks. Enjoy the broadcast. Ask as many questions as you like. Um, and I will see you in a few seconds after we just watch a little bit of boot fit in action. Good evening, gentlemen. Evening, Andy. Good evening. How are we doing? Everyone good? All good, yeah. Good here. Cool, fantastic. Yeah, first, first, things first, first things first, before we start, have you both got a drink? Of course. Fantastic. Cheers. Here's Cheers. To good, here's to a good broadcast. So, um, thank you for coming and taking part. I know you're um, very busy. Um, enduring lockdown, Colin. Uh, the shop's been closed for some time, but uh, thanks for spending your Sunday evening with us. I know you uh, were a bit concerned you might miss your roast dinner, but uh, I believe you've had that already. Already done. Already done. Already done. Fantastic. Fabi, thanks for joining us. I know uh, obviously you've got a, a small child that you needed to get off to bed before we could start, but hopefully he'll stay sound asleep. So, Hope so too. we are going to get straight into it with questions because we have got a lot of questions and I am also expecting, if I turn the comments on, we've, yeah, we've already got some more questions in the comments. So let's get on to it. So first question, this is just a little, a little opener. Um, it's pretty much the end of the ski season, or it should have just been the end of the ski season. Uh, everybody <coughs> travelled home with their boots off their last ski trip, or if they're a ski teacher, the season has ended and they're out to pack their equipment away until next winter. What should we have been doing with our boots at the end of the winter, Colin? Well, most important thing is obviously to dry them out thoroughly. So liners out, give them two or three days natural time to dry in a warm room, no direct heat. Then when you put everything back together, loosely clipped up and just enough to hold the buckles closed. And you want to store them in a temperature stable place. So spare room wardrobe under the spare bed, avoid the loft where it gets very, very hot or cold, avoid the shed where the mice might eat them. Okay, cool. So nowhere too hot, nowhere too cold, nice ambient temperature. And anything we can put in the boot to stop a buildup of moisture or anything like that? Do we need to do that? Fabi? No, nah, nah, you don't really need to do that. The only thing you could do is you could just fill it, let's say, with some paper just to kind of keep the liner in, in shape so it doesn't drop down too much if you buckle the boots up. That's the only thing you can do, but don't really have to be worried about moisture if you keep it in a nice temperature room. Okay, good stuff. Okay, so um, our first question from one of our uh, watchers is um, it's from a, a lady called Natalie. Now, Natalie, I believe you are a ski teacher and maybe you've done a little bit of racing. I think you're watching from Switzerland at the moment and I also believe it's your birthday. So happy birthday, Natalie. Um, 
she's probably now thinking, how the hell do I know it's her birthday? But let's just say I've been speaking to Gemma McMillan in Australia and she says hello. So um, firstly, Natalie says, thank you for hosting this. Well, that's okay, Natalie. Uh, and allowing us to ask the questions to the pro boot fitters. No problem. And then she says, this is brilliant. So hopefully Natalie's pressing the like button about right now. So here is Natalie's question. It is quite a long question, guys, uh, but it should enable us to answer several of the other questions that we've already got. Are you listening carefully? We're listening. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <Here we go. laughs> okay. <clears throat> If I am correct, when we stand on the outside ski, we are basically balancing on one foot. And therefore, it is important to have the ability to let the foot splay naturally. To have an optimal tripod on the first and fifth metatarsal, ball of the foot and the heel. I have never really understood the concept behind building a footbed. Why take an imprint of the shape of a foot to then later trim the footbed to fit the shape of the base of the liner? especially in race boots. If you trim the footbed, it doesn't represent my foot anymore. My big toe and my little toe end up sticking out of the side of the footbed. And then, it, and then it's my foot that has to conform to the shape of the liner. Shouldn't it be the other way around? Shouldn't it be footbed liner shell interface matching exactly the shape of the foot? If the boot forces me to balance more on the outer edge of my foot, change page <laughs> and my toes versus on my, on my metatarsals. Then I don't have a good base of support. And also what's the point of purchasing, uh, of punching the shell if the foot is restricted by the shape of the liner to start with? Thank you, Fabi and Colin for your answers and for helping me understand. And thank you, Andy, for reading that out. <laughs> Off you go. Off you go. Good night nice story. A good night nice story. <laughs> Off you go. Colin, after you. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I think the one of the most important things to realize is the front of the footbed is there purely to stop it sliding forward inside the shell or in the liner. So any footbed is working from the metatarsal heads back the way to stabilize the foot, try and keep everything nice and balanced inside the boot. When you then cut it to the shell shape or the, the footbed shape that comes out of the, the boot, it's really an accommodation at the front end. So you're going to do the work on the, the shell, the liner, and then if it's a major job, you can leave that footbed a lot wider to, to sit under the entire foot, but it's comfort more than anything. It's not really a, it's not, it's not a mechanical issue at the front. Fabi. Fabi. I would say, let's say, for example, you have a very wide foot and you want to use or you're using a kind of a race boot, a plug boot with a 92 millimeter forefoot width. Like this foot, for example, is a 122 millimeter forefoot. And the footbed is also kept a little bit wider to kind of cover the entire foot. Um, then you have to do kind of liner modifications, which should be the next picture coming up where you actually take, it doesn't look nice because that boot is skied in entire season, I guess, um, you take the black sole of the liner off, you slice the liner in the middle from the toe to about, about the middle, and then you kind of widen it and re-glue the sole um, uh, onto the liner. And that gives you about a centimeter or in that case, two centimeters more room for the footbed. And, and therefore you can leave the footbed as wide as you need actually to kind of cover the entire foot up. And of course, if you do, do this, then you have to do, of course, the share modification as well. So um, first you start with the with the liner, then you give the shell more more width, and then everything should kind of line up nice and smooth around your foot, w w without having the big problem that you can feel the edges on the on the metatarsal heads on the outside. Okay, hopefully, uh, hopefully Natalie, that answers the best part of your question. If it doesn't, then just drop me a message and. Uh, we will get you in contact with one of the guys to explain it a little bit further. Now, just for your uh, information as well, Natalie, that foot, that extremely wide foot and that boot with that modified inner, modified? modified inner is Christian Eigener, who I believe you know. So next time you see him and he has his ski boots, ask him to have a look at them. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Natalie. Have a very happy birthday. So our next question, Dennis O'Brien, what's the best product to stop foamed boots smelling? 
The best product is cheap and it's free. Um, keep them dry because wet boots start to smell after a while. And the other good product you should use is not just one pair of ski socks. Maybe wear uh, every day a different pair of ski socks. So they always keep, keep fresh and they can breathe. And that keeps the boot from smelling overall. And if so, then there are a couple of uh, manufacturers who offer like different hygienic sprays like Holman Cold Dust, Toko Dust. You can just use them, let's say, once a week, and they keep it nice and smelly like a bowl of fruit. Okay, cool. So that's kind of um, how to prevent them smelling. What if they have already started to smell, Colin? Is there anything he can do to get rid of that odor? Okay, there's a couple of products you can get. Uh, footwear deodorizer products, the kind of thing they use in the bowling alley uh, for doing the bowling shoes. You know, that kind of that rental shoe that you really don't want to put your foot in. I... Baking soda, I uh, have been told, does withdraw moisture or cat litter in, in a, a nylon stocking will take away, absorb moisture and odor. Uh, but as Fabi said, drying them out properly to start with, keeping them dry, fresh, uh, fresh socks every day, clean, dry socks every day is the best way. Cool. Um, I'm, I'm grinning and laughing slightly because I can see the comments and some of the questions that are coming in. And... Uh, yeah, somebody is basically just posting uh, some stupid things, uh, not related to ski boots, I would, I would uh, add. Um, so I'm going to bring in the first question from the comments, actually. Um, here we go, coming onto the screen now. So this is from Tayton, who is a ski teacher there in his uniform. Hi, Sunday Ski Cast. I currently own three different types of skis for various different uses. Should I wear different boots for different activities? Okay, I'm going to firstly uh, answer that, Tayton. You should only have one pair of skis for everything, and then you wouldn't need to worry about this. But, guys, what are we saying? Does he need different boots for different things? Okay, I'll jump in there. And uh, I think uh, for generally, no. You know, if you're just going skiing the whole mountain, a little bit of off-paste, a little bit of messing around the gates, then you can get away with one pair of boots. However, if you're going to start doing some serious gate training, you need a proper race boot. If you want to go ski touring and do some serious up, you're going to have a lighter weight boot, which has got a good walk mode in it, so you can basically move faster up the hill. So it really depends at what level you want to perform at and what kind of thing you're doing. But if it is just going skiing off piste and a little bit of gates, I would get in your race boots and go skiing. There you go, Tate. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, thank you very much for asking it. Now, guys, we've got a special guest. You may have seen her just pop up on the screen, and she is here to ask you a question, and that is Melanie Marlinger, last week's guest on the show, our Olympic mogul skier, nine-time national champion, and our first Olympian in 10 years. She's back. Hello, Melanie. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi. Looks like you're thank you for having me. Mel Sorry. Looks like you're sat outside the farm this evening. Yeah, I'm on a different spot, so I have the mountain just right behind there, the Hochkönig. It's beautiful, and Fantastic. it's warm enough finally to sit outside. <laughs> oh, just one quick question to you before you ask your question to the boot fitters. I believe you've had a development with training, and you can now get to the water ramp. That's true. I finally made that my coach, Alex, can come in from Slovenia, as we found a way that he can pass the border the legal way. So now he's in Mulbach and uh, yeah, we have to do a Corona test. And as soon as this is positive, like in a negative way, yeah. um, we can start with our water ramp training. And yeah, I okay. cannot wait for that. Brilliant. Okay. So ask your question to the, to the boot fitters. Yes, I do have a question because I guess that you get all sorts of feet in your shop. And yeah, I want to ask if uh, many of them smell so bad that you need to ask the people to come back another day. And if yes, what was your worst experience you had? Colin? Well, I, I probably start as, as I work in a ski resort and Colin in a nice tiny little village. So um, <laughs> yes, I did send a few people home as they were smelling really, really bad, not just on their feet, all, all over the place. <laughs> especially in February when our Eastern European guys come over and they ski one week in the same outfit, the same socks, and then they come in after six hours skiing and they stink. And I nicely ask them um, maybe go and change your socks or at least have a shower, clean, come back. We are here till 6.30 in the evening and if you come later, I, I'm happy to stay a little bit longer to help you out. And some of them I really appreciate, some complain, but 
yeah, as soon as my colleagues start smelling him as well, they kind of agree and ask nicely as well to yeah, have a little Colin? change. Uh, for me, uh, the worst are, I'm afraid to say, is the ladies. Normally they come in wearing nylon stockings or nylon tights <sighs> and sweaty feet and nylon don't mix. Okay. And if it's not those, it's never used to suffer it so badly with skiers, but walkers, hill walkers and hikers were the worst because they wear that same pair of woolly hiking socks for days and days and then they come <laughs> walking into your shop expecting you to fit their boots. Okay, ah, so. I was curious about that because like you guys maybe know I also do fit my boots and I'm always wondering like yeah I think it's normal to go there with uh, after a shower but I guess yeah. there's some other people not doing that so that thank you for answering this question and yeah. I would just jump over to watch you guys further there Brilliant. thanks Melanie thanks yeah. for popping back thank you, thank you. Bye. Bye. See you Bye. Okay, fantastic, Melanie Marlinger. Right, next question. Now, this is another footbed question. We may have already covered a little bit of this off, but let's um, ask Adrian Hamilton's question. I think Adrian is potentially a ski instructor also in Switzerland. He says, I have heard several top skiers, Tom, Tom Gelly uh, <laughs> being one of them, talking about dispensing with footbeds to allow the foot to articulate more freely. I am guessing they are themselves pretty symmetrical and don't suffer too many fitting issues. Even that said, I would be interested to hear your views. So another footbed question. Okay, right. I'm going to apologize now and I'm going to try not to get too technical because it's a technical question. There's going to be a technical part to the answer. The common misconception people keep talking and ski shops are probably some of the worst for this. They talk about uh, footbeds and ski boots to support the arch. Big no-no. We don't want to support the arch, we want to fill the gaps, and we're stabilizing the foot, not blocking it. So it's a stability. We want to allow the foot to flex and articulate, but we've got to prevent the foot from elongating too much, because if we have a really mobile foot, that could elongate by up to two sizes. So you can have the size eight ski boot, we don't do ski boots in UK sizes, but imagine a size eight, or we can have a size 10. And that two sizes of difference of elongation of the foot is what we're trying to reduce with the footbed. It's a stability, not blocking. So it's rear foot stability, allowing the foot to articulate. And it's really, really important that the foot can articulate around what's called the mid tarsal joints so of the middle of your foot uh, is the joints that are basically allowing you to control edge motion or motion to the edge. So allowing that articulation is important. And when we build a footbed, I build three different brands of footbeds in three different ways. And I can vary the stiffness and the flexibility to the individual athlete and their foot. Okay, good stuff. There you go, Adrian. Hopefully that has answered your question. Um, and yeah, they, there it is. So next question, Tina Biggs. Hello, Tina. Uh, don't know where you're from, but hello. Um, she says, hi. Hi, Tina. Um, I would like to know how long a ski boot is good for, as I love my head boots. I do three weeks skiing a season and tend to ski for around three or four hours a day. Um, so there we go. Fabi, life of a ski um, boot. Life of a ski boot is normally about 150 up to 200 days. It's about equal to five to six years of, of usage. Um, after that, you will definitely feel that the, that the liner is worn out, is packed out, that you feel looser in the boot. Sometimes the, the, the liner creates a little hole as well, means the liner is just done. And, and also you can feel due to, um, due to uh, in, the, in the plastic, that, that the plastic will get softer and softer after a while. And especially if you should do some skiing in, in springtime, you will really kind of um, over flex the boot and you won't get the support from the boot to get the pressure onto your skis. So um, these two are the, the, the main factors when you know that your uh, ski board is done and you should look for a new one. Okay, good stuff. There you go, Tina. Hopefully that uh, gives you an idea of when you next need to buy a pair of boots. So I'm going to bring another one in from the, um, the comments. This is from uh, Linz, Linda maybe. Is it okay? I know, I know Linz, she's good. Ah, okay, she's is, good it, is it okay to use boot warmers in zip fit liners? There you go, Colin. Absolutely. Absolutely, Lindsay. Yeah, if it not the big industrial ones, the resort dryers, but your little drop-in 
boot warmer, your Thermic or Sidas or whatever brand it is that you can drop into the boot, plug in and go. Absolutely no problem with your zip fit liner there at all. Cool. If she was going to put them on the big industrial ones in the hotel, then obviously take the footbed out first, eh? No, just don't. Just, just don't, don't do it. There. Just don't do it. Okay, don't do it. There we go. There we go. Good job. I'm not giving the advice. Okay, thank you for your question. One more on the screen. From Carl. Hi, Carl. Uh, hi, guys. From Belfast. Hello, Carl in Belfast. There, is there a specific sock to wear uh, with fitted boots? Is there a specific sock to wear when skiing? Well, I always say kind of uh, wear, the, wear the thinnest sock as possible. Uh, first of all, it keeps your foot warmer as it gives the foot a little bit more room in the boot to kind of um, breathe. And secondly, um, secondly, if you wear a thin sock, um, the boot will then feel a little bit snugger the first couple of times skiing. But as soon as you kind of give a couple of days time, you will feel that you just give this little tiny bit of extra room um, that, that the foot can uh, kind of spread out a little bit more. But thin socks are definitely a better, better option as uh, super thick ones. Okay, thin socks all the way. Um, Carl, watch this space. I may be able to bring you a sock expert in the coming weeks um so thank you carl um oh don't worry about that one guys i pressed the wrong button um <laughs> i've not actually read that one yet so i don't know what it is don't know whether we want it on the screen um so another one from the presenting questions this is from sally um okay yeah sally is asking i keep hearing the term last when people are talking about ski boots, what does it mean? Okay, I'll get techie. The last is originally was the shoemaker's shape, the shape that they designed the shoe or the boot on. So being backwards, the last comes first because that's where you work from. Then you build your liner around it, your shell around that. So when they talk about last in ski boots, what they're talking about is the width across the forefoot and you'll probably see numbers like 98, 100, 102, even 104. But that is only in a size 26.5. Okay, so when your boot goes bigger than the 26.5, it gets two millimeters wider per size. So 27.5 in a 100 millimeter last would be a 102, 28.5 would be 104, 29.5, 106. And the same thing happens going down the way as well. So it's the width for the forefoot, but absolutely critical is you should really ignore it and speak with your boot fitter because what we've got to do as fitting ski boots is we want to get the back of the foot, the heel, the ankle, the instep area secure. We can make the forefoot as wide as we need to. Okay, there you go. There you go, Sally. That's what last thing. Um, Rob, Rob is asking, are boot flexes standard across brands? So I think he's referring to a 130 flex atomic versus a 130 flex head versus a 130 flex Rosignal, let's see. No, you can't really say that these uh, that every manufacturer has the same kind of flex, uh, like all the flex numbers which are kind of written on the boots are just kind of guidelines. You can see the Atomic Boot at 130, the Fisher 130, but the Atomic Boot definitely feels a little bit stiffer as the Fisher Boot, as the... This atomic boot is the ultra, so it's, it's a cooler meat plastic, a super light plastic, and feels a little bit stiffer. And the fish is a vacuum. Vacuum plastic is a very easy heat moldable plastic, so therefore it feels a little bit softer. So not even in the same brand, let's say for example Atomic, not, not even every 130 flex is the same stiffness. Um, recreational boots from Atomic in a 130, they're definitely softer as kind of race boots from Atomic in a 130 flex. That has to do with plastic uh, thicknesses and different plastic mixtures. So you can't really, you can't really say that um, all brands have the same 130 flex, for example. Okay, good. There you go, Rob. Hopefully that's answered your question. I think it was pretty clear. Um, let me just check the comments, see if we've got another question that we can bring onto the screen. Okay, uh, I got mute. Okay, here we go. One from Alex. Alex Horsfall. Hors Horsfall? Hi, guys, from Yorkshire. Hello. Um, when putting on boots to heel tap or not to heel tap? That is the question. So should he be hitting his heel down to pull his foot back in the boot? Depends. Could it be vague? 
depends. For some people, it's really, really important to pull them into the back of the ski boot. If they have a limited flexion or it's a brand new boot, especially when the foams are quite uh, dense still, it helps to settle the heel to the back of the boot. But other people can clip the cuff of the boot up and flex a few times, and that's enough. But if, you, if it helps you center your heel and seat your heel right to the back of the boot, absolutely, go for it. Okay. I always, I, I always kind of tell my, my client, just give it one or two firm hits on, onto your heel, because whenever you put a boot on, your foot automatically slides forward uh, towards the end of, of the boot, especially when I have a client who needs new ski boots in the shop. And I say, well, this is your size. They put the foot in, oh, the boot is way too short. And I just tell them, just... You just, just kick twice on, on onto your heel, foot sides back, let me buckle up the boot, and then I say, oh, no, you're right, there's enough room in front. So, but like Colin said, either, either way is fine. Either way is fine. There you go, Alex. For what it's worth, I do do it. There you go. Cool. So, so one... I one, told you. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Right. Uh, Steve would like to know, would you recommend a custom aftermarket liner over the one that comes with the ski boot? Um, Colin? Depends how much skiing you're doing and if you have problems. I mean, for me, I don't get an awful lot of skiing these days. This year I got two and a half days. It was a disaster. But uh, if your foot shape works with the stock liner that comes with the ski boot, fantastic if you're skiing one two even up to three weeks a year normally for my clients i recommend once we get to three weeks a year or more i recommend we certainly start talking about a custom in so a custom footbed no nope, nope, custom, custom liner not custom footbed that's a standard but uh, custom liner once you're doing three or three or more weeks a year then we certainly talk about it some people uh, love the idea some people just don't have the budget to spend they do last longer and it is something you can perhaps put in halfway through the life of the boot Right, okay, so you can kind of replace your original inner with, obviously, yeah, absolutely. A, a different inner. Okay, good, there you go, Steve. Um, we've got one from Lindsay, which I'm going to bring onto the screen now. Um, Hi, I have a problem with my two toes on both feet feel like they are broken when, my, when in my boots. I've had insoles fitted many times in a shop in St. Anton. Uh, only relief is to take the foot out, flex her toes, and start again. Happens after about two hours. Go on, guys. It's the question of which toe. The big toe, probably, huh? I reckon. Okay. Lindsay, which toe is it? If you want to pop it in the comments, it will take a few seconds to come through to us, but uh, we'll, we'll bring you a question back once we know which toe we're talking about. Um, okay, so back to the questions that were sent in. Mary is asking... I only ski one week a year. Uh, is an off oh it, okay. I only ski one week a year. Is an off-the-shelf footbed sufficient, or should I get a custom one? Another footbed question. Okay. Um, <coughs> you guys start talking. I'm going to bring up just of off-the-shelf footbeds and custom footbeds. So for me, uh, I, I, I'm a big fan of custom in ski boots because skiing is a side-to-side -side sport and everybody can do with ex that extra stability or most people can do with that extra stability. I, an off-the-shelf product is certainly better than no product at all. And it is oftentimes better than a badly made custom product. So if you trust where you're going and you've got the extra, little extra budget, I would go custom. If you can't really justify that, then an off-the-shelf product is certainly, you know, there's some great stuff out there right now. Uh, Boot Docs, Sidas, Superfeet all make great off-the-shelf products. And if that's where your budget lies and for one week a year, it's perfectly acceptable. Okay. Um, Mary, apologies. That isn't an off-the-shelf um, footbed I showed you there. One is a custom and one is what comes naturally in the boot. But I suppose my, my, my philosophy on this is if – if they are, if their boot is comfortable and it works for them with the one that's in the boot, then all well and good if they're only skiing once a week. If they want that additional um, custom footbed in there for whatever reason is needed, then obviously I would think that you need to have it, no? Yeah. Yes, so. yeah Depends okay. on the boot. Yeah, cool. I ski many, many years um, without a custom footbed. Um, and I have to say, I then realized the hard way from many, many weeks of pain under the ball of my foot, burning like hell, that I, the, the reason was I hadn't put a custom footbed in. And now I no longer have that pain. 
have other pain, but not that one. Okay, let's see what we got coming on the screen. Do we know which toe it is yet from Lindsay? Yes, we do. Uh, no, the two next to my small toe. Okay, so it's here. Uh, if, if the small oh, toe is number one, it's two and three. Or third and fourth, going third the other way. Okay, right, let me bring a question back up for you guys. Where's she gone, Lindsay? There we go. So, the two toes next to the little toe feel like they are broken. What are we thinking? I'm thinking there is potentially, now, without assessing this properly and having it assessed by a biomechanist or a podiatrist, pedorphist, somebody that actually understands the ins and outs of the foot, that it is potentially a nerve neuroma, okay? You can Google that one. Morton's neuroma is slightly further over, but a nerve neuroma is an entrapment, basically, of the nerve between the metatarsals, and it tends to give this sort of, it can be a pins and needlesy type pain. It can be a stabbing sharp pain. It can be the worst crushing. Feels like your foot's been put in a vice and just crushed at that point. When you take the foot out of the boot, you give your foot a rub, you put it back in, and everything's good. Okay, there you go, uh, Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay, tell us where you live. Are you close to Colin in Vista? Maybe worth popping into the shop. I think he's opening again um, in a few days' time. When are you opening, no, Colin? Fourth of July. Oh, fourth of July. Oh God. Yeah, okay. we're not. We're not allowed to open before then. Still not allowed to open. Okay, so I have got another one, which looks like it's for you, Colin. It's a technical one, I think, or it's about. Well, it's more anatomy based. Hi guys, I have a problem with one of my boots. I believe it's tibialis anterior tendonitis. Yes, <laughs> which hurts on the dorsum of my right foot. I have zip fits, but I don't know what to do with the pain. Go on, Colin. Okay, uh, with the ZipFit liner, you can inject some more cork into the tongue of the boot, which sounds counterintuitive because we're about to make it tighter, but what it will do is give a more <laughs> even fit across the top of the boot. Uh, okay. And then possibly some adjustments around the, clip, the, the cuff of the boot, the clips where it closes, just how it closes. Okay, hopefully that is uh, of help. Hopefully that is uh, the answer you're looking for. So Trevor has sent us um, one in. And Trevor is asking about what is canting? I have heard so many different descriptions. Now, I think a lot of people don't uh, understand canting because, as we know, boot manufacturers make us believe it's actually uh, cuff alignment when it isn't. So, Fabi, if you want to take this one. Yeah, I'll jump in there. So, canting. Canting is just at the bottom of the boot. Uh, maybe you could just show those two pictures. There you go. On the... On the left side, you can see a white head boot with no changeable uh, soles underneath. So these boots are actually made for it to kind of grind off the bottom, to grind off the plastic at the bottom to uh, create different angles, either outwards or, or inwards. That's canting. Um, what all the manufacturers write on these two little canting screws or like, um, like uh, cuff alignment screws, sorry, um, it's all kind of written canting, but this is actually called cuff alignment. So cuff alignment is the upper part of the boot and canting is kind of happening at the bottom of the boot. Okay, so there's another image for cuff alignment. So the cuff can go either in or out. And if you look at the bottom of the boot there, Trevor, you'll see where the space is taken up uh, from them bottom arrows. So two different things. Canting is on the bottom of the boot on the sole and cuff alignment is moving the cuff from left to right or <laughs> inwards or outwards. There you go, Trevor. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, David, David, I had a pair of boots for several years now. I did two full ski seasons with them, winter 1617 and 1718. Uh, they were fitted by a well-recognized UK boot fitter and they were great until this winter. My left foot was in a lot of pain, but only when not skiing why might this have happened uh is it time for new a new pair of boots um can i use my current footbeds in a new pair of boots um given that they are seven years old and his boots are full to tilt full tilt boots well i'm gonna say if he's done two full ski seasons that's between 30 and 40 weeks skiing time for new boots sir fabby Yep, I agree with Colin. Um, 
Yeah, and footbeds, it depends on which shape they are, but if they're all a couple of years old and if they have a, a plenty of, of uh, ski days on there, they will definitely give more away and they're not as stable as we want them anymore. Cool, there so, you go. I, I, I also will go with Colin, um, David. If you've done a couple of seasons, then you probably do need a new pair of boots. Uh, here's an a interesting one um, I'll bring onto the screen. So this is from Tim, Timothy. Hello, hello, Tim, a long time. Um, wondering how he can get into the boot fitting business well <laughs> on my side it was a lucky catch actually after after i worked in garmisch for a couple of years i did my apprentice in garmisch for three years i got a job offer from america so i went to america to Aspen, colorado to be precise for for one full season and I expected to work in a ski rental shop, but then I've seen that they do boot fitting over there and I got really interested after my work hours. I kind of started playing with them around on shells and footbeds and liners and I kind of fell in love with it. And after the season, I came back to Europe and I got a call from Technica and they uh, asked me if I would be happy to work for them on, on, on the World Cup tour. So for me, it was kind of like a really lucky catch that I'm in this business now. Colin? Uh, well, I'm going to flip this question because I'm wondering if, if uh, Timothy is wondering how he gets into the business. But uh, I got in by mistake. I'm a carpenter at trade. And I'd worked in a ski shop on a dry ski slope when I was a kid at school. And when the, uh, the joinery and carpentry business I worked for went bankrupt in 1991, I went back to the only thing I knew, which was ski boots. Okay, so I've been a, long, a long road since then. Yeah, I, I would think t Tim's question is based on how would he get into the business. Now, there are some training courses you can do, aren't there, Fabi? Exactly, yeah. Um, either way, there is a course, a course called Masterfit. It's originally from America. Uh, as boot fitting is way bigger in America as it's in Europe, as let's say they kind of started earlier as Europe uh, did. In Europe, we still have a very small number of good boot fitters. In America, in every big ski resort, you will find a master fit like a like a master boot fitter almost um and they have uh, every year for they have a two-day course in kitbull uh, where they kind of it's it's all in english uh, where they go through all the all the different parts of boot fitting like share modification liner modification foam liners and footbed and so on and from this one you can really learn uh, gain a lot of information and that will really help you to get an idea what, what boot fitting really is Cool, good stuff. There you go, Tim. I think, Tim, with your knowledge of skiing, uh, with what you've done, I think you'd make a, a cracking boot fitter, mate. Um, Just so, don't yeah, expect um, me to pay the lot. Yeah, well, <laughs> ski teaching don't pay, pay any, any better, I can tell you. Okay, cheers, Tim. See you soon, hopefully. Um, now we've got <laughs> another one. Oh, okay, so, Lindsay, we will get you the contact details for Colin after we finish the broadcast. Um, I just saw another question... Here we go. So Pete Horam is asking, what do you advise for someone in between sizes? Colin, you go. I okay. it, it's going to depend on the level of skier and what that skier is doing. So He's quite good. He's all right. He's a good, he's right. He's a good skier. Then I, if, it, you've got to try and find the, sh if you're going to go into a bigger shell, you're going to find the shortest, lowest volume shell you can use. Or if you're going to go into the shorter shell or the smaller size, if you like, you want to find the longest version of that that you can use. And then you're going to have to do some modification in the toolbox. So with the correct tools, you can extend the ski boot easily four or five millimeters. You can get a lot more. I think Fabi had one. Uh, he did about a size and a half out of a shell. But it depends on the plastics. It's just a thing like Pete, um, I have fitted him. Pete is skiing in an Atomic. I think it's a Hawks Ultra 130. I think it's a red boot. And uh, that plastic is not really like easy to kind of give you a, a big toe stretch. So that's why we may went for the slightly bigger size as the smaller size might be too small and we wouldn't gain it, uh, enough room out of the toe box to make your foot feel comfortable in there. But I think I spoke to Pete and before I went into hospital and I think we kind of agreed that we do it beginning of next season that we would have a look for a new kind of a new boot where we have more options maybe to to play with okay there you go peter um and and another one this is an interesting one. Oh, i need to get peter off the screen there we go 
So this is Alesh. Uh, this is Melanie's uh, mogul coat. Oh, maybe it isn't. Or maybe it is. Uh, which boot is the best for a coat? Standing a lot, but still want to rip the moguls and do some calf turns. Well, um, Technica Kuchis 130 is quite an awesome boot um, with grip walk, walk mode in there. It's a 130 flex, it's quite stable. You can really go bad with that boot if you want to. Um, Atomic Backland, uh, no, Atomic uh, Ultra XTD. XTD, XTD, Ultra XTD is a 130 flex. It's definitely stiffer than the Technica boot due to the grillamy plastic with a nice walk mode. Like, yeah, I would go if you want to have a very sportive and high performance boot and go with the Atomic, the XCD. That's quite a badass boot, if I'm allowed to say that. Do you have them in the shop now, um, Fabi? Yes, um, now I'm not sure, but I think so. I should yeah. not all sizes, but I definitely have a boot here if you want to pop over and have a look at them. Okay, good stuff. Brilliant. Cool. So back to the questions that we got sent in during the week. Um, what have we got here? Oh, okay, yeah. So um, this one came via YouTube. So somebody from YouTube, ATJ Bramley via YouTube. Firstly, he says, this whole broadcast was a great idea. Thank you, mate. <coughs> um, what are your thoughts on shell gap for different types of boots? Most people are aware of heel side top shell gap in a basic alpine and race boot. But how does this change in a touring boot? Colin? You want to go for it, Fabi? Okay, like a uh, ski boot, <laughs> ski boot, race boot is about a centimeter, one and a half centimeters. You should have the gap in the shell with your uh, naked foot in there. Um, touring boot, of course, you want to allow a little bit more extra room as you have a lot of movement, let's say, with your lower leg and your ankle back and forth. If you would go too short, your toe would always hit the end. But as touring boots, they have a some most of them have a very thin liner in there, which gives you automatically a little bit more more room in there. Um, I would I would go I would definitely say you 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 you're measuring at twenty six point five. I would definitely try on a twenty seven. Some brands come out bigger, some brands come out smaller, um, but it varies. It can be that a twenty six five maybe feels comfortable for you, but it can also be that a twenty seven is fine. Like ski boot, uh, ski touring boots. I will not, you know, count on it because there are so many different brands out there and they all have different uh, shapes inside. Okay, there you go, um, ATJ Bramley via YouTube. Uh, thanks for your question. Have a nice evening. Uh, Peter, my big toe always ends up blue after skiing. What can be done to avoid this? Okay, this is quite a common one. Um, Colin, you going to go first? Yeah, I'll hit on that. So various things it can be. I, everybody likes to blame the ski boot and say it must be too small. <coughs> Normally, it's not the ski boot's too small because you would never have left the shop with a ski boot which was physically too small for you because it's hard enough to get people in a ski boot the correct size. Okay, because a ski boot the correct size feels a little short to start with. So it could be the boot's too big. It could be the shape of the toe box. It could be the technique issue of just leaning back. It could be as simple as just how you clip the ski boot up and making sure you're anchored right to the back of the boot. So upper buckle is really nice and snug. And then the lower one's not too tight. On the other one, and we've seen so, so much of this, is it could be a limited amount of movement <coughs> in your ankle. So a limited amount of flexion at your ankle. So you're not able to flex forward fully, as fully as you need to, which means you end up essentially in the back seat, leaning back a little because your body won't allow you to go forward. If you do that, automatically your cuff, your calf muscle hits the cuff of the boot and shunts you forward. Cool. There you go. Um, anything to add, Fabi? Well, it just depends. Let's say if the boot is the right size and you kind of buckle up your, your boot properly, then might be the size is just really exactly. And if the size is very exactly and everything is done right, like when buckling up, putting the boot on, then it can just be needed that you need a little liner stretch to make the liner a little bit longer and the shell as well, just to give the big toe area a tiny little bit more room, a couple of millimeters, and that will make life also a little bit easier. Okay, cool. Uh, from my from my side, um, who asked this question? <laughs> Peter. Yeah, Peter. Um, cut your toenails as well. Make sure your toenails yeah. are nice and trim whenever you're skiing. Um, I used to have problems and it was, I didn't have excessively long toenails, but they were just a little bit too long. And therefore um, I was just 
hitting the front of the boot with my toenail and that was causing my nails to go black. So there you go. Um, thanks for your question, Peter. I think just um, add to that. Can I just add to that, Andy? I think oh, a little, yeah, sure. uh, some, quite often if you go into a shop which doesn't have a really good boot fitter or doesn't have the tools, they will tell you you can't stretch the length of the boot. Mm -hmm. We get told this so many times. The shop in the resort says you can't make this ski boot longer. It is very, very simple to make a ski boot longer if you have the correct tools and know how okay. to use them. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, wicked. Uh, Mary, every year on my ski holiday... Ah, Mary, good, yes, because I was thinking about this today as well. Uh, every year on my ski holiday, the first couple of days, my feet and legs are killing me before they ease up. What can I do to make it more comfortable? So, firstly, let's talk about the legs. Why are Mary's legs tired or hurting? Well, Mary... I... Colin, Colin, you go no, 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 go, go, go. On you go. <laughs> well, um, maybe just a couple of weeks before you go on to a ski holiday, um, just kind of start, kind of do a little bit stretching your hamstrings, your calf muscles, just kind of stretch them, um, that will definitely help to get the, the, all, the, all, all the muscles a little bit warmed up and stretch out. So it just all gets a little bit easier from day one on. Because the same, if you come out of a, uh, for example, out, out of an office and just straight on to ski holiday, you're mainly sitting there and then you have to do five, six, six hours of kind of heavy moving around and jumping up and down. It definitely will kill you. So let's say if you just start three, four weeks before you go on to holiday and just give every day 10 minutes, a little bit stretching, the definite that it will make your first couple of days skiing a bit more enjoyable. Yeah. The, the other thing I suppose, Mary, is um, how is your physical fitness or your base fitness? Um, do you do any training before you go away on your ski holiday? Um, because it, your legs is probably more about your legs uh, or the, the condition of the legs than it is the boots, I would expect. But why are her feet um, in so much pain, do we think? I think she's probably just tensing. It's the first first few days in in a new environment. You know, you've been wearing loose fitting shoes for fifty weeks of the year, and I always look at skiing and uh, ski boots as a little bit. It's a little going skiing is a little akin to running a marathon or running a ten k race. And if you didn't train for your ten k race, you'd have blisters and sore feet and achy legs. So you're in a slightly compressive environment in the ski boot. The foot's a little compressed. You're a little tense, a little maybe nervous for the first few days in skiing, pushing, trying to push it, trying to keep up with a group or trying to go as much mileage as you can. And just everything's tense. So a little mini foam roller, a thing called a nano roller uh, from Trigger Point is really, really good. Just rolling under the foot, and that will help stretch out the fascia under the bottom of the foot, just get everything a little bit looser in there. Okay, good stuff. For, for, for me, um, from a ski teacher point of view, uh, Mary, um, what I would be asking without seeing you is, do you feel as if you are holding on to the base of the boot with your toes? Are you trying to grip by curling your toes? Because potentially, if your boots are a little bit too big and you're trying to grip with your toes, what you're going to do is you're going to push your ankle back. And by pushing your ankle back, you're going to end up in a back position. And that for sure is going to kill your legs. Because if we're in a back position or a potty position or toilet position, whatever you want to call it, our legs have to work um, so much more. And because you might be curling your toes, maybe, um, curling your toes, it's pushing you back automatically. You're not in the centre of the boot, uh, sorry, the centre of the ski, and therefore your legs are working a lot harder than they need to. So if that sounds familiar, drop me a message. Um, okay, good stuff. Uh, we got any more here? I'll have a look at that while you're answering the next question. Um, Margaret, I always get cold feet. Me too. Um, is there something you would recommend to stop them getting cold? Okay, how are we going to stop cold feet, guys? First thing would be a, a, a wool sock, wool-based sock, because wool can move moisture and hold moisture, get that away from the skin a lot faster. It can hold about a third of its weight and moisture before it feels damp. So that's something for your sock expert in a few weeks' time. Uh, heaters, boot heaters. Boot basically being too tight. If it's compressing around the calf or compressing over the top of the foot, you could be cutting the blood off to the toes. Now, boot feeling too tight over the top of the foot doesn't mean that the boot's too small. It means you're tightening it too much over the top to hold your foot, which may mean the boot's too big. 
I, or heated a heated element or a heated sock. You can have underfloor heating installed in your ski boot. Uh, it's come down in price rapidly over the past couple of years. The quality's better. It's now Bluetooth controlled, so you don't even have to bend down to turn it on. Okay, good stuff. So a few different options for you there. Uh, anything else to add, um, Fabi? Yeah, one one big big thing is actually let's say if you go on holiday to a big ski resort and you put your ski boots on in the hotel and you take the bus and everything means you take the boots straight off the hotel boot heater. You put your foot into a hot boot and by the, by the time you get to the lift or start start skiing, you, your foot starts sweating and of course then you have wet feet and cold temperatures. It's a bad combination. So kind of make sure you don't put your boots on too early or kind of um, just leave them with, with room temperature. It's definitely better as a properly boot dryer, hot boot. Yeah, well, obviously, if you put in your foot into a hot boot, your foot's gonna start sweating, your sock's gonna get wet, and before you know it, you're gonna have a freezing foot once you get onto the hill. Okay, I've got a, a, a lengthy one coming onto the screen, Colin, um, or for both of you. Uh, are there sure, tools yeah. Telemark boots in 21.5. Just wondering if I want to give either of these a try. Would I be able to get boots in my size? I struggle to get any boots in my size as it is, and I love my Atomic 21.5 boots, but I hear they are no longer in production. Guys? Okay. So Evelyn has a an Atomic uh, Red Star World Cup one, uh, 110 and the 21.5, which they're withdrawing from production with the new STI and TI boot. A Telemark boot, I'm not aware of any. Touring boot, I believe Dalbello make one of their uh, their boots. I'm trying to make the name of their touring boot. Lupo. The Lupo, they, I believe Lupo. they make a Lupo in a 21.5, but it's a really big 21.5. It's not It's not any smaller than, than the 22.5 in most other brands. Okay, how 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 what 21.5? What size foot's that? UK small, it's about, <laughs> Very about, small. A, two, about a two, two, about a two and a half, two, two and a half real size, you know, in reality. Right. Wow, okay, cool, cool, cool. I've learned something there. Um, okay, Carl is asking, uh, is there a particular brand that you think is best or believe in? What do you recommend? Okay, well, <laughs> Fabi. Well, <laughs> Well, the best brand is always that brand which fits your foot the best. Uh, what I mean with that is um, if, if I have a client for new boots, I give my client maximum, maximum three pair of boots. Actually, the client is lucky if he gets a third pair of boots to try on. Normally, just end up with two. Um, the, the, the thing we are looking for is the out-of-the-box fit, like the, the first fit means you put your foot in there and from the beginning on, you have a snug, comfortable feeling in there. So. It's hard to tell without seeing your foot to give a recommendation, but the best boot you can get is go to a professional boot fitter. The boot fitter will give you two options, and one of these two boots normally is always the jackpot, and that's the boot we normally didn't work with. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Now, people, we've got 31 people watching and only 24 likes. That doesn't add up to me, so I need to see a few more likes, please. Um, now, what we are going to do, though, because we are running up to the hour mark is uh, I'm going to do one one last question. We'll have a little bit of a summary, and then I think we should call it for this evening, guys. Um, and then we can come back because we have still got four pages of questions. We can come back in a couple of weeks' time. Um, maybe once we've learned a lot more about socks. Um, Kevin, hi. I'm sorry I'm late, just back from work. No worries, mate. We're just about to finish. Uh, <laughs> but you'll be able to watch on, on repeat or on demand. There we go. I just got us four more likes. There we go. Now we've got 30 viewers and 30 likes. Fantastic. Um, so last question. It's a nice, simple one. Um, Roy wants to know how tight should he be buckling his boots? I believe the shell should hold your foot. The liner shell and the liner should hold your foot. The buckles are like the laces on a shoe. Okay, so if everything fits you properly, you're going to do the upper buckles fairly snug to hold your foot to the back of the boot and go around your, your ankle area. But the lower buckles in your boot, they should be just finger tight. So enough to hold it. If you're having to wrench down on them, I saw somebody selling a tool to help you lever down on ski boot buckles. Uh, unless you've got really bad arthritis or some other physical disability and that, that tool helps you, you really shouldn't have to use it. No. If you are, your boots are worn out or too big. 
Yeah, way too big, way too big. Um, who's asking this? Roy, I actually, um, I don't do the two lower buckles up on my boots um, unless uh, it's a very warm day and I've been in for lunch and I've come out my boots feel a little bit looser um, or I really want to hoon it down. I might, I might fasten them up, but they're never, never done up tight. Um, so yeah, you can actually have them undone if your boot is a good fitting boot. Okay. Um, sorry for those of you whose uh, questions we haven't yet answered. We will do a follow-up broadcast and we will get the rest of them. In the meantime, the, whatever comes into the comments from now on, we will try and respond to in the comments or we can add them onto the next broadcast. <coughs> But we are going to call it. So just quick summary for you, um, Colin, on the questions we've had. I know we had a lot of footbed-related questions, uh, a lot about pain in toes, legs, and things like that. Last couple of closing words from you. I think, uh, I mean, footbed is really, really important, but they've got to be made properly. They've got to be a stability device rather than a blocking device. You know, different, different feet respond differently to different materials. So speak to your boot fitter, expect them to have different products there, work with them. Uh, it's a two-way relationship. You know, this is not something we don't see clients and send them off to the hill. And I'm, I'm in a slightly different position to Fabi being in a UK-based, you know, town-based shop where we see the client, they have to go away to the snow dome or the dry ski slope, or they go away on their first, their ski holiday. Our intention is not to cause pain. Nobody's intention is to cause pain in a ski boot. Uh, but it's a two-way process. There has to be a lot of feedback from the client as well. We can, you know, if they tell us it feels comfortable, we have to believe them. If they tell us it feels too tight, we have to believe them. So trust your boot fitter, but work with them. Yeah, Fabi. Um, as I live in a ski resort, I can just tell if you come on to holiday, you have troubles with your ski boots, um, ask your ski instructor or ask at the reception of your hotel um, where to find a boot fitter. Don't, don't ask where you find a ski shop, ask where you find a boot fitter, as a ski shop will just easily sell you a new boot because they will just tell you it's too big, it's too small, whatever. A boot fitter can save a lot of money and can uh, definitely fix, or normally can fix your current ski boots and make the rest of your ski holiday enjoyable without spending tons of uh, bucks. Cool, okay, from my point of view, um, who asked this question? <laughs> Ro no. Uh, Carl, Carl, from my point of view, Carl, um, yeah, let the boot pick you, don't pick the boot. Um, every snowflake is unique, and so is everybody's feet. So, yeah, let the ski boot fit you. Okay, chaps, thank you very much for joining me this evening here on the Sunday Ski Cast. We are almost out of time. We will come back with a subsequent broadcast that I've said to everybody. Rosgod, I've just seen you pop up in the comments. We didn't yet get to your question, so don't worry. We will get it answered, as we will with you, Kevin, and everybody else that, unfortunately, we haven't got to this evening. But thank you very much. It's extremely positive to have so many questions. And thank you once again, Colin and Fabi, for joining me. And we hope to see you back next week. Um, I will confirm tomorrow, but I think we are going to be talking ski socks and I will give you some more information once I have that confirmed. But from myself, it's a bye for now. See you later, Colin. See you, Fabi. See you later. See you, Andy. Bye-bye. See you guys. Bye -bye. See you guys. Bye-bye.